Hi, my name is Ryan. I'm joined by my colleague Karthik, and today we're going to talk about Amazon Document DB. So we'll talk about Amazon Document DB. We'll walk through some case studies. We'll talk about what's unique about Document DB from a, an architecture perspective. We'll go through a little bit about the what's new, and then give you some next steps in terms of, of Document DB. So AWS has the broadest offering of cloud services across databases and analytics. And we take a Swiss Army knife approach to these services. The service you will use typically depends on the use case. Broadly speaking, we offer relational databases, and these are for customers wanting to, to move away from self-managing their Oracle, SQL Server, MySQL, Postgres, uh, Maria databases. Uh, we offer Amazon RDS and Amazon Aurora for these types of workloads. We also have a set of non-relational uh, database services, and these are for customers wanting to move away from self-managing their non-relational document or key value stores, such as MongoDB, Redis, Memcached, uh, et cetera. And we offer DynamoDB, DocumentDB, and ElastiCache for these types of workloads. For customers that want to move from their expensive proprietary Teradata, Oracle, and SQL Server data warehouses, AWS offers Redshift, and for customers wanting to move their on-premise Hadoop and Spark deployments, either for cost savings or, or having a manual, managed service, AWS offers EMR. For customers that want to move from their expensive Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana, typically referred to as the Elk Stack, to a managed service, we offer the Elasticsearch service. And for customers that want to move their Apache Kafka deployments, we offer the Amazon Managed Streaming for Kafka service. And finally, Customers that want to move from their Tableau or SAP type of applications, we offer quick sites. So what is DocumentDB? DocumentDB is a fully managed, scalable document database service that supports MongoDB workloads. It's fully managed, so it's managed by us. Uh, it, there's no hardware to provision. It's easy to set up through the console, and you can spin up a cluster in minutes. We've got built-in high availability. Clusters are automatically provisioned across multiple availability zones. Our best practices are enabled by default. So for example, backups, we don't allow you to disable backups because we believe that's a best practice. From a durability perspective, your data is copied six ways across three AZs. You're only paying for a single copy of that data, but the, the five additional copies are, are stored for free. And then from a security perspective, you can use identity and access management and built-in role-based access control to enforce least privileged access. Patching and maintenance are handled automatically by the service. And we have native integration with other AWS services such as CloudWatch for monitoring and setting up alarms and CloudTrail for logging and auditing. And these native integrations help to simplify your, your tech stack. Our customer, FINRA, used DocumentDB without any overhead from their engineering teams. DocumentDB is scalable, so separation of compute and storage allows you to scale both of these aspects independently, and Karthik will talk a little bit more about that, what that means from a, an architecture perspective. You can scale compute horizontally or vertically in a matter of minutes, minutes regardless of the amount of storage in the cluster. Storage and IO auto scale from 10 gigs up to 64 terabytes, and there's no need to worry about taking care of you know, additional EBS volumes or scaling an on-premise SAN when you're utilizing DocumentDB. And you can scale out your, your up to 15 read replicas in a matter of, of minutes. Iron is another customer with DocumentDB, and they can scale their cluster in minutes regardless of the data size. And finally, we're MongoDB compatible. So we're compatible with MongoDB 3.6 and 4.0. You use the same SDKs, tools, and applications. We support hundreds of APIs and operators and aggregation stages. And we work backwards from our customers. We start with you and get feedback on the product, which is fed back into our engineering teams to implement feature requests. Our customer Freshworks love the fact that we are comp compatible with MongoDB and their application required zero code changes. So when is a good time to use a document database? Well, probably the, the, the most obvious is when you're working with JSON data. So document databases store data in a JSON-like format. And JSON is flexibly structured and maps naturally to how we think about data. Um, we typically don't model data in tabular formats in our head. We're thinking about groups of things instead. 
you would use a document database when you have a requirement for a flexible schema. So with document databases, there is no need to design a complicated rigid schema. The schema can change depending on our data needs and access patterns. If you're looking to do ad hoc querying um, and you want to retrieve specific values and fields uh, and work with regular expressions, um, document DB is a great use case and example of that. We also use a JSON-like query language, so it's really easy to learn. And flexible indexing. So indexes in a document database can be created and dropped on demand and can be declared on any field within your documents, including fields nested within arrays. So many customers across different industries and verticals are utilizing Document DB. We've been GA since January of 2019, so a little bit over two years in the market. Uh, we have a lot of customers that are running mature workloads on Document DB, anywhere from a, a small startup to a Fortune 50 customer um, will use Document DB for their production workloads. In terms of use cases, Document DB spreads a, a, across a variety of different use cases. So. Um, when you look at content management, so a lot of the content that we read today from news articles to blogs to recipes to patient records, all of that data lends itself really well to a document model since it's dynamic and changing. Mobile is another great example. It's very easy to store data that you collect back and forth between mobile devices because JSON is a de facto standard for data interchange. Catalogs, being able to record the outputs of machine learning experiments inventory descriptions, pharmaceutical trials. We see a broad set of customers that use documents for these types of use cases. And then gaming, storing user profiles, game management and matchmaking. These are all great examples of uh, document DB use cases. Anytime you have a complex document that's dynamic and changing and requires ad hoc querying, indexing and aggregations is a great example of when you might use document DB. I want to transition now and talk a little bit about a case study. Uh, so Rappi is a, a current Document DB customer. Customer, they're a startup. They're very similar to DoorDash, and this is an app that handles restaurant orders, grocery delivery, and and clothes, clothing delivery as well. So their business problem is that they were were seeing an explosion of growth, and they had a, a popular uh, delivery service that experienced a lot of different outages in their in their prior environment. They had built a monolithic application and needed to support a more flexible and microservices driven approach. They were also seeing slow performance from their, their prior system and it affected thousands of users. Um, sometimes queries were taking up to a second or more to, to complete. So they were looking for a service that was compatible with MongoDB. They also wanted to independently scale their microservices. Their, their prior architecture had a huge Elasticsearch cluster for all of their different business units uh, across different countries. But most importantly, they wanted to get out of the infrastructure management business and eliminate the undifferentiated heavy lifting uh, that comes, you know, goes along with maintaining um, your infrastructure. So the solution was that Rappi created a, a single cluster per business unit, and this gave them the ability to scale micro, their microservices. The horizontal scaling of, of read workloads reduced the query latency quite a bit. And you can see here from uh, 16 times from 500 milliseconds down to 80 milliseconds. And with minimal code changes, they were able to migrate from, from MongoDB to DocumentDB, resulting in 60% of FTE cost savings. So the solution advantages, uh, you know, since implementing DocumentDB, they've had no outages. Um, their lar largest cluster took two weeks to migrate, um, but then af after they got through the migration process, they were able to perform over 100 migrations in less than three months. But most importantly, Rappi now has only two engineers managing their entire document DB employment. This reduced their operational overhead substantially and allows the engineering teams to focus on value add activities. So I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Karthik, to talk a little bit more about Amazon Document DB architecture. Thank you, Ryan. Hello, folks. My name is Karthik Vijayaraghavan, and I'm a Document DB specialist solutions architect with AWS. I'm going to be talking about Amazon Document DB architecture today. Uh, we will discuss the architectural components. I'll focus on some of the salient features as listed on the stack. I will walk through the stack and show demos and code samples and console overview to show how Document DB works. At a high level, Document DB is architected to separate storage and compute so that they can scale independently. 
I'll use this diagram throughout the presentation to discuss the features and core capabilities of Amazon Document DB. Before we get into the stacks and the various uh, inner capabilities, I would like to show you a console overview uh, to see you know, what Document DB cluster creation process looks like and the various uh, features and capabilities uh, in the Document DB admin console. So let's start uh, with a console overview. All right, so I'm here in the Amazon Document DB uh, console, and you see uh, that you know I have one cluster over here, and this is the landing page, uh, and I'm in Ohio region. So let's go to the cluster. So I've already pre-created a cluster, but uh, let me show you how to create a new cluster, and then I'll walk you through this pre-created cluster. So click on the Create button over here, and give a name for your cluster. Let's call this to be Getting Started, and uh, you know, I'm going to choose the engine version uh, 4.0, uh, which we released uh, last November. The other older version is 3.6. I can choose an instance class, and uh, there's like a wide uh, range of options over here, all the way from two vCPUs and 16 GB RAM to you know uh, 96 uh, cores and 768 GB RAM. We also have this. Uh, T3 medium instance, uh, you know, with two C vCPUs and four GB RAM. Uh, I'm, I'm go gonna go ahead and use that for, for this demo. And you can choose the number of instances. Uh, I'll, I'll just say one, but you can go all the way up to 16. So you can have one primary and 15 read replicas. I'm just gonna say one instance uh, for now, and you can give uh, the username and password. So, like that and that's uh, the minimum set, set of fields that you need to provide to create a cluster let's take a look at the advanced settings because more often than not our customers do create document db in, in a vpc of their choice so document db is a vpc only service and uh, you know you can select a vpc at the time of cluster creation so i'm going to choose this vpc that i've already created and as you saw, the subnet group automatically populated. Subnet group is basically a collection of subnets within that VPC uh, where you want your uh, instances to be uh, distributed. So let's say each subnet group has one availability zone and uh, you pick a, a subnet group with, our recommendation is to pick one with three availability zones uh, so that your instances are distributed across those availability zones. And then comes a uh, security group. You know, a security group is, is uh, as you may know, it's a virtual firewall uh, for uh, in front of the document DB cluster here. And uh, it, it helps you to minimize the surface area of attack. So I've already pre-created a security group called doc DB inbound, which allows inbound, uh, you know, request from a specific set of application servers over port 27017, which is a default port for document DB uh, using TCP protocol. So the, by this, I'm telling that nobody other than uh, you know those those application servers can talk to my document DB. So I'm, I'm minimizing the surface area of attack. So I'll leave the port as default uh, 27017 and cluster parameter group. Uh, you can you, you know either use the default cluster parameter group or I've created a cluster parameter group and I'll walk you through uh, through these and the subnet group as well. So uh, you know uh, when when you need to create uh, when you need to you know publish audit logs or you know profiler log you need to enable that first and by default they are disabled and uh, uh, you know the customers would enable that as and when they need it uh, so you know you you can create a cluster parameter group uh, and you know you can enable audit log profiler log and you know, chain streams and all that stuff so it's all configurable for you. And then encryption at rest, uh, the default uh, value is it's enabled. So when it comes to security, all the default settings are, you know, they adhere to the best practices. And, uh, you know, here uh, we are using um, KMS uh, key and uh, pro uh, provided by Amazon. So for encryption at rest, we integrate with KMS and, you know, by default, uh, your, your Amazon provided key is available. But if you want to bring your own key, you can do that as well. Backup. By default, is for one day, but you can, depending on your retention period, choose uh, any value between one and 35. I'm gonna leave it at one. I'll, I'll say that the backup window is about you know, midnight, so this is where the uh, 
automated snapshot will be taken. But again, keep in mind the backups in document DB are continuous and incremental so that you can take point in time, do point in time recovery. And now logs. So you can you know, uh, choose to publish these logs to CloudWatch and so that you can then go and use log insights and you know, perform further anal analytics on those logs. Uh, maintenance window. Document DB is a fully managed service and you can choose a maintenance window uh, so that we, we, we will use that to you know, uh, apply upgrades and, and patching and stuff like that. So I typically like to do this uh, you know, maybe 1 a.m. on a Sunday so that there's probably very less usage for the system. And last but not the least, tags. Uh, tags are, are, are best practices. Again, uh, you know, when you when you use tags, then you can use them for things like cost allocation tagging, so that you can take a look at you know which which uh, resources associated with which tag is contributing to the to the cost, right? So that that's a good practice to tag your uh, you know clusters. And then deletion protection is enabled by default. This ensures that uh, you know nobody accidentally deletes your cluster. You can delete individual instances, but when you try to delete the last instance, uh, you'll get an error saying that hey, this cluster is uh, has has deletion protection enabled. So if you want to delete the cluster, then you have to come over here, uncheck this, and then delete the cluster. So so with that, I'm I'm just gonna go ahead and say create cluster. So as you can see, getting started cluster is in creating status. Uh, like I said, I have already pre-created a cluster, so let's go and walk through that. So the first tab here is connectivity and security. Uh, you can see that there are a couple of connection strings. So if you want to use uh, Mongo shell, you can just copy the string and replace the password. And if you are uh, you know, using an application, Java, Python, Node.js, whatever that is, you can copy this connection string. And this has all the best practices in place, and I'll talk about this later in the presentation. The security group uh, is DocDB inbound that, that we selected at the time of cluster creation is over here. So if you look at what this security group contains and how it is configured, it's, it's fairly straightforward. It just has like one um, inbound rule, like I said, uh, TCP protocol and 27017 port and accept anything that comes from this security group where my app server in this case, I'm using Cloud9 as my app server. So I'm, I'm going to say that you know any 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 request coming from this app server on this specific port, uh, please do allow that document DB is what this means. So let's go back to our console here and look at the instances tab. So here you can see that uh, you know I have two instances. So for this cluster, I've created a primary and a replica instance uh, of of R5 extra large, and uh, you know I can. Uh, uh, do do more further operations, which I'll do in subsequent demos on how to scale and stuff like that. But this this uh, view gives you the list of instances, and the various configuration options we selected at the beginning. You can see them over here. You can modify to change some of these, like if you want to change, uh, you know, the security group or backup retention period, maintenance window. You can do all that uh, in the cluster. So let's go back to the cluster view and monitoring. Right. So this cluster, uh, you know, like you can you can view uh, monitoring uh, metrics at this cluster level here, and uh, you know there are more than fifty metrics that Document DB provides. You can either view them here or you can add them to dashboard and view them in CloudWatch. And then events and tags gives you you know the the tag that you created at the time of cluster creation, and then uh, you know if there are any recent events, which there is none for this cluster. And then if I go through this uh, uh, menu on the left, uh, you know, we saw whatever is under clusters, like under snapshots, you would see that there is one snapshot. Again, this has a backup retention period of one day. So it creates automated snapshots on a daily basis. So the last snapshot created was, uh, you know, on this particular day. Um, and then like subnet groups. Uh, so I use this subnet group for uh, while creating the cluster. And as you can see that there are three subnets, uh, and each subnet has one availability zone. So any instances we create are going to be distributed across these availability zones. Parameter group, we chose the uh, cluster parameter group. And you can see that this has audit log, profiler log, all enabled. So you can, you can choose you know, what uh, should be the threshold for the queries. If it is like you know, um, 100 milliseconds, we are going to be logging 100 milliseconds or more. The queries that take 100 milliseconds or more to the profiler uh, log. 
and then events will give you all the events uh, for all the clusters in this region Ohio and then we have like what's new to educate our customers on what we are launching and some tutorials to you know get your hands dirty so that's that's about the console overview demo so let's go back to the presentation now and uh, look at the various architecture components thank you all right so I hope you enjoyed the console overview uh, now uh, I will start with the first component of the stack, which is compatibility. Amazon Document DB is compatible with MongoDB APIs. You can use the same tools, drivers, and applications to develop against Document DB. As shown in the slide, an application here sends a query to Document DB using MongoDB's Find API, and you can expect to get the same response that you would have received from MongoDB when you query it against MongoDB. So let's take a look at a basic application. This application connects to document DB, inserts a record, and reads the record back. It's a very, very, very simple application built using MongoDB driver. So let me go to the uh, uh, Cloud9 environment uh, and show you how this application works. I'm here on the Cloud9 environment. Cloud9 is basically, think about it like an EC2 running on uh, on a browser. Uh, it's convenient to show code samples and uh, you know move, move files back and forth. So I choose Cloud9 environment over EC2. So here is the code sample that I was showing earlier. And uh, you know all that I'm doing here is uh, connecting. I'm getting the secrets from Secrets Manager. But uh, you know before talking to Document DB, I'm going to be talking to uh, MongoDB. So this line of code connects to MongoDB running locally on this this uh, server. Um, and I'll, I'm just going to be doing an insert operation, and then I'm going to be reading that data. And once we are done. I'll come back here and switch the connection string and do the same operation just to show uh, you know the compatibility aspect of uh, document DB with MongoDB. Let me go to this tab and I'm gonna say Python 3 and I call this a sample app. So as you can see, I did insert a document and then uh, when I read this document, I got this uh, document value back X Amazon document DB. Uh, with an object ID. Now let's go back to our sample app and uh, we will just uncomment this connection string and we will comment this connection string over here. So uh, all that I'm doing is just swapping the connection string from MongoDB to DocumentDB. And I'll walk you through this connection string and the various uh, you know uh, parameters over here as we go through this uh, presentation today. So the rest of the code remains the same, saving it, and I'm just gonna run the same command. As you can see, uh, now we performed an insert operation and a find operation against document DB. We got the exact same value. The object ID is gonna vary by, from a system to system, but uh, you know what, what you write into document DB, um, into MongoDB earlier is what you got back. Um, so you got exact same results. And that's what we mean by compatibility. We'll now talk about separation of storage and compute, the second uh, uh, component of the stack. Amazon Document DB was launched in 2019, and when we built the service, we took the opportunity to purpose build this architecture to leverage the scale of the cloud. Document DB is built from ground up as a cloud native database service, and it adheres to the best practices of the cloud. When you look at traditional database architectures, they are built as a monolithic architecture that runs locally on a server. The database process does everything from receiving and processing queries, caching, logging, persistence, and so on. And the storage is attached to the instance. And to scale this architecture, you'll have to copy the entire stack, just like this. This is a typical challenge we hear from our customers uh, especially around moving data, because moving data uh, is, is, is literally painful, uh, and you know this scaling process makes it uh, all, all that painful. And it takes days or even weeks, depending on the volume of data and the network performance. To address this challenge, we separated storage and compute. As shown here, storage and compute are separated to two distinct layers. 
the compute heavy work, like you know, a- handling API requests, query processing, caching, all of these are offloaded to the compute layer. And you know, uh, work like replication, backups, all those are offloaded to the storage layer. And then instead of sending 8K pages to the storage layer from the compute, we send log writes with specific changes and the storage layer reconstitutes these pages. So separating storage and compute layer helps us to break apart the monolithic architecture and it lets you to scale compute and storage independently. We can start with a simple T3 medium instance and then scale as needed. We will discuss later in this presentation on how durability is not a function of the number of instances in the cluster. And a single instance as shown here, T3 medium instance will provide you very high durability. Starting with T3 medium is very common for development purposes and we recommend doing that. It helps you save cost. As your workload grows or your environment matures, you can scale your instances up and out to get more compute and memory. Let's say to R5 large in this case, where you scaled up from T3 medium to R5 large to get more memory and compute. As the compute and storage are decoupled, scaling does not depend on the storage size and completes within minutes. We, we typically say it completes in about eight to 10 minutes. You can add new instance for high availability or for read scaling. With three instances as, as shown here, you get about four nines of availability. With document DB's cloud native architecture, scaling out or scaling up of instances does not depend on data volume and it can be done irrespective of the storage size. We see our customers scale up their instance to run complex analytical workload and then scale it back down. As, as you see in the slide, uh, you know you can run a, a larger instance to process those heavy queries and then you know either, either delete them or scale it down. We also see our customers scale their instance uh, scale their cluster during peak hours and then scale it back down. Document DB's architecture provides the flexibility to accomplish this kind of scaling without worrying about the time it takes, especially for workloads of large uh, you know with large storage size. And the extent to which the storage and uh, compute are decoupled is that you can delete or stop all your instances and still have a highly durable storage. You will not be able to query this, of course, because there's no compute, uh, but you can store the da uh, data durably. And when you, want, when you have a need to query, you can just add an instance or, or multiple instances and start querying. We launched a capability called Strat Stop Cluster that allows you to stop the cluster when you don't use it and then start it when you need it. Uh, let's take, for example, a development environment, right? Where you know there's not much work happening over the weekend, stop those dev clusters over the weekend and then start them back on Monday. You save two days of cost on the instances. Thus, separation of compute and storage not only helps with scalability, but it also can help with uh, you know, cost savings. So, now let's take a, a quick look uh, at the console. I'm gonna show you a demo where I'm gonna be adding a, a new instance. Basically, I have, a, I have pre-created a cluster uh, with, with couple instances and I'm gonna scale this cluster and I'm also gonna take a backup. And this cluster has about 12 terabytes of data. So what I'm gonna show you here is a live demo where I'm gonna scale a cluster with, which contains 12 terabytes data and at the same time, take a backup. So. With that, let's go to the Amazon Document DB console to take a look at this demo. Okay, so I am here in the console and I have uh, the demo cluster here. So before I perform scale operations and backup, let's go to the monitoring tab and take a look at uh, you know how much data we have in this cluster. So like I said before, we have about 12 terabytes of data in this cluster. You can see that in the volume bytes used metric. All right, so let's go to the cluster and uh, let's add uh, another R5X large instance to this cluster. So I selected this cluster and I'm saying add instances and I'm saying R5X large. Uh, again, a best practice is to keep those instances homogeneous. So I'll just use the same instance class and I'll say create. 
So you can see that the third demo three instance over here isn't creating status. All right, let's also go to the snapshots uh, you know, menu over here and uh, let's click create. We are gonna create a snapshot for our, you can pick and choose the cluster. In this case, the demo cluster is the one that has the 12 terabytes data. So I'm gonna call this as demo snap. You can give any name here and say create. There you go. So the the snapshot is, is being created and you can see that it is uh, categorized as a manual snapshot. So we'll come back to this, uh, you know, after after a while. Um, let's let's go back to the presentation and uh, you know take a look at the other um, architectural components. So let's let's move on. We'll look at the next uh, component, which is replication. One of the advantages of DocumentDB architecture is that replication is offloaded to the storage layer. This will free up the instances for more read capacity and query processing. When you write data to DocumentDB, you will write to the primary instance. The write operation will replicate the data across three availability zones, as you will see in this animation. So you, you see the data in the first uh, block over there, the second, third, and fourth. DocumentDB uses a write quorum of four. After four copies of data is written to the storage, the primary instance will send an acknowledgement back to the client. The primary instance will also replicate the data to the replica instances to keep those instances up to date with the latest data. If the replica instance don't have the data resident in their memory, then we don't pollute the buffer cache, allowing each replica to manage their buffer cache. And while this is happening, the data is further replicated to maintain six copies of data across three availability zones. And since storage layer handles the replication, the replica instances are freed up to perform read operations at scale. As a best practice, we recommend that you connect to Amazon DocumentDB cluster as a replica set and use the read preference as secondary preferred. This setting will allow you to scale your reads by leveraging the read replicas while allowing the primary instance to focus on handling writes. Since storage and compute are segregated, decoupled, and durability is offloaded to storage layer, you can use the replica instances to scale your reads for complex queries without impeding the durability, as long running analytical queries will not block your writes because they just go to a separate instance. So let's uh, uh, take a look at the code again. I'll in this demo, I'll, I'll show you how we connect as a replica set uh, to scale reads. So I'll just do a quick code walkthrough that we uh, started off in our one of, one of the first demos. I'm back at the uh, Cloud9 environment. I'm uh, at the sample app Python file that I started off uh, in, in the first demo. So here you can see that uh, the connection string for document DB, uh, you know, initial uh, attributes or configuration parameters here are you know, about the post and port and username password, we get all this from a secrets manager. So that's a nice and clean way of doing it so that you don't, uh, you know, uh, use credentials in your code and rather get it from secrets manager. So it's nice decoupling there. And um, I'm connecting with SSL enabled and uh, I'm passing the cert as well. So the replica set uh, that I was mentioning earlier is, is over here. So you can, this is how you connect document uh, from your application, you connect to document DB as a replica set, right? So that you use say replica set equal to RS0 and then give the read preference as secondary preferred. So with this connection string, what happens is uh, when you perform inserts, the write operation goes to primary instance automatically. And then when you do a re uh, find, the read operation is routed to one of your read replicas. Right, so all, all the available read replicas, uh, you know, participate in this, and uh, you know your, your your driver would send the request to one of the instances. And as you add more read replicas, they automatically participate in in the uh, so in supporting the read operations. So so that's that's uh, how you connect as a replica set with read preference secondary preferred. Moving on, let's talk about durability. Storage in Amazon DocumentDB scales automatically 
and increments in 10 gigabyte segments. By default, the data is replicated six ways across three availability zones for high durability and resiliency. Let's walk through a scenario. If one availability zone goes down, this is again very, very rare and uh, you know would, would be a bigger issue than just Darkman DB. But let's say if one availability zone goes down, we will still be able to achieve uh, the right quorum, that is creating four copies of the data, which is required uh, to send an acknowledgement back for a write operation. Read operations, on the other hand, requires a quorum of three. So read operations will not be impacted by an AZ failure as well. So in a nutshell, even if one AZ goes down, Amazon Document DB cluster would continue to perform just like as it was before. And now let's say another copy of the data in, in another availability zone is lost. Now we lose the right quorum because there's one AZ down, one copy of data down, and there's only three uh, to me, uh, three copies, so there's no write quorum of four, but read quorum is still available, and you can still read data from the database. So with one AZ and one uh, co data copy being lost, you can still read from the database. DocMinDB stores data in 10 gigabyte segments, and fa when failures like these happen, the mean time to recovery becomes a function of replicating uh, you know, these 10 gigabyte segments or partitions instead of a monolithic architecture where you have terabytes of data. So the mean time to recovery is the time it takes to copy 10 gigabytes of data over the network to rehydrate another copy of storage. When using a distributed storage as opposed to a monolithic disk volume, mean time to recovery is orders of magnitude faster. So now let's take a look at uh, a quick demo, which is again gonna be a quick code walkthrough on write concern. I'll show you how document DB uh, uh, you know, durably uh, stores writes uh, into the cluster. Okay, I'm back at the app here and uh, in the connection uh, string, you see that the write concern and journal are commented. Uh, when, when you uh, perform a write operation in document DB, you can be uh, rest assured that the data is gonna be durably persisted. And to facilitate that, we use write concern as majority and journal as true, uh, regardless of the value that you pass in. So if you pass write concern as one, we will override it to be write concern as majority and journal as true, so that uh, you know your, your writes are durably stored in document DB. Let's talk about backup. Backup in DocumentDB is different than how traditional databases uh, perform backups. DocumentDB has a no impact, no impact to backup because we stream the backup from storage layer to S3. We perform continuous, incremental, and full backups to S3 so that we have a fine granularity with incremental backup and a fast restore times with full backups. As you can see in this slide, I have not included any compute instance uh, that, that shows that we're taking a backup. This is because compute instances in document DB do not participate in backup. Backup is offloaded to storage layer, and this further frees up compute instances to perform you know, query processing and read heavy workload. So if you, if you want to take a backup of your production system, you don't have to worry about you know, backups bringing your system to a grinding halt or impacting your application's performance as backup is happening at the storage layer and not at the compute layer, which directly interacts with your application. We are always streaming to S3 and document DB has backup enabled by default. You get one day of backup at no charge to you and when you, uh, conf whether, whether you configure this backup or not. And when you configure backup, again, you can choose a backup retention period all the way up to 35 days, and you'll be able to restore uh, from this backup, and you can perform point-in-time recovery with document DB. So let's go back to the console and check how our scale and backup operations are doing. We, we started this about like maybe seven, 10 minutes ago. So you know, let's, let's take a look at, uh, at the console to see where, where we are with this process. So I'm back at the uh, document DB console and let's go to our demo cluster. So initially we had two instances and I added the third instance. If you remember, I clicked on this and I said add instance. Um, so this third instance is now 
it was in creating state when we left it here earlier and now it's in available state. So this instance is available and it automatically participates uh, in, in supporting the read request that comes from your application with no changes to your application whatsoever. And then, you know, let's go to the snapshots. So I uh, initiated this manual snapshot and we named it demo snap and you can see that its status is also completed. So in about seven, 10 minutes or so, we scaled our cluster, we took a backup uh, without impacting any real uh, time operations to the cluster. So that's that's uh, you know the power of um, segregating compute and uh, storage layer. All right, so we created a 12 terabyte snapshot and scaled our cluster in less than 10 minutes, which is pretty remarkable. So, uh, let me quickly summarize on what we have discussed in the last 20-25 uh, minutes over here. We discussed about how DocumentDB's cloud-native architecture helps to scale and uh, scale compute and storage independently uh, by decoupling them. While DocumentDB is available to you as a service, uh, internally it's, it's a group of microservices performing you know, different tasks such as query processing, replication, and so on. Monitoring is integrated with CloudWatch, and so are CloudWatch alarms. All of this is available as a single package to you as a fully managed service. We saw how compatibility with MongoDB helps to build or migrate applications to, uh, to DocumentDB, and replications and backups are offloaded to storage, freeing up instances to perform more compute-heavy work. Durability is built in by default by replicating data six ways across three availability zones leveraging the cloud infrastructure. That is document DB for you uh, guys. And uh, with that, I'll give it back to Ryan uh, and he'll talk about pricing and uh, some of the cool stuff we have uh, released in the, in the recent uh, days. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Karthik. Now let's talk about pricing. So with document DB, we price uh, the service across four different dimensions. The first is instances. So it's the, the size of the instance and the number of instances that will determine your cost. And in US East 1, our pricing is 7.8 cents per hour uh, for the T3 medium instance. We uh, charge per hour, but we bill down per, per second. So um, uh, the first 10 minutes is a, a minimum when you start your cluster. But after that, we bill down to the second. Um, you can also stop the cluster to stop billing on your instances. However, we'll restart that automatically after seven days to ensure that you're, you're up to date with the latest patches. The next dimension that we, we charge on is pricing, or, or sorry, IO. And so with IO, it's 20 cents per million. And we charge in, uh, uh, we do writes in 4K chunks and then eight uh, reads in 8K chunks. Um, we group I.O. together, so if you're doing multiple uh, writes, uh, one after the other, um, say multiple 1K writes, we'll group those together and then only count that as a single I.O. operation um, down to the distributed storage. So the storage is the third dimension that we price on. We charge $0.10 cents per gig per month. Um, as I mentioned before, we store your data six ways across three AZs for durability purposes, but we only charge you for a single copy of that data. So if you have 10 terabytes of data, you're only getting charged for 10 terabytes, but we actually have 60 terabytes of data stored in the, the distributed storage volume. And then backups are the, the final dimension that we price uh, DocumentDB on. Um, so with DocumentDB, we don't allow you to turn backups off. So because of that, we'll give you up to 24 hours uh, of a window for backups for, for free. So if you're storing, again, 10 terabytes of data in the cluster, uh, you can store that data for free up to the, the 24 hour uh, window. If you increase the window, there will be, you'll be charged an additional charge at 2.1 cents per gig per, per, uh, per month. And you can increase that window from uh, the 24 hours up to 35 days. Um, if you need data around for longer than 35 days, then you can take a manual snapshot and that will stick around for as long as you need it. So what's new in DocumentDB? We recently launched global clusters. Uh, this allows you to distribute your, your data in DocumentDB to clusters across the globe. 
So this capability is important for applications that are globally distributed um, that need to read data that is closer to the users. Uh, this capability also increases the availability target and RTO for your document DB clusters. Um, so you can withstand a region failure and be back in business with minimal downtime, generally in less than a minute. Uh, Mongo 4.0 transactions. So we launched ad asset transaction support in November of last year in 2020 along with MongoDB 4.0 compatibility. So you can use DocumentDB to, form, to perform transactions across collections or databases. And then new operators and performance improvements, you know, working backwards from our customers' needs, we continuously add more operator support, aggregation pipeline stage support, um, and we've made several improvements to our indexing capability to help improve performance of, of the queries. In addition to these releases, we've um, come out with T3 mediums for uh, better pricing. Uh, we've increased our connection limits. We have new region support and, and many other features that have been released in the past year. And we'll continue to add capabilities to, to help our customers uh, move more and more workloads to DocumentDB. So what's next? We will continue to work backwards from our customers' needs. Um, you know, you can look at a, a few really important pages here that we've displayed. So the first one is a, a, a resources tab, and this keeps track of announcements and, and additional blogs that we've written on DocumentDB. Um, you can also uh, use our, our workshops uh, to learn more about DocumentDB by leveraging our Immersion Day workshops. And so these are workshops that are um, done on site, uh, in, you know, virtual for now, but usually done on site. And we'll go through a document DB overview similar to this. Uh, we'll also go through a best practices. We'll, we'll show you how to uh, size your clusters and choose the correct instance types. And then we'll do a segment on uh, migrations for your clusters and, and show you the best practices behind migrations. Um, again, yeah, yeah, these are great workshops to to uh, to learn more about DocumentDB. We also include labs in these workshops. They are optional, but in the labs you can stand up your own DocumentDB cluster. You can scale the cluster. You can do. Um, we'll show you how to do simple CRUD operations, and then uh, add on some monitoring and uh, um, some alarms if you'd like to to see how those work as well. And so with that, I want to thank you for listening to this presentation on DocumentDB, and thanks again. In this section, we will discuss about the best practices for Amazon DocumentDB. We're going to cover a wide range of topics uh, from cluster sizing to security. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about how to scale, how to monitor DocumentDB, you know, uh, some cost optimization techniques and some indexing uh, optimization ideas. And uh, we'll also talk about how to connect and the best practices around all of these. So let's jump right into it. Uh, DocumentDB is architected to uh, separate storage and compute so that they can scale independently. Storage scales automatically and compute instances can be scaled up or out as required by a workload. And the data and the storage layer is replicated six ways across three availability zones for high durability. So let's start with the first topic uh, in, the, in the agenda here for best practices, which is sizing. The number of instances in a cluster determines the availability target. With one instance, uh, you know, uh, it's generally okay for dev and test, you get about uh, two nines of availability. With two instances, you get three nines of availability and it's minimum uh, required or recommended uh, setting for production. Now, when you use three instances, you get four nines of availability and this is a best practice that we recommend you use for production so that you can get uh, four nines of availability, which is the highest availability you get within a cluster. Now you can add more than three instances, but this is not gonna improve your availability target. It will help to scale your read capacity, but again, the maximum availability target within a cluster you get is gonna be four nines. And for that, you need a minimum of uh, you know, three instances. So the best practice again is to use three instances, which is two replica instance and one, one primary instance. The vCPU or the compute and the memory per instance determines your performance of the cluster. DocumentDB provides a range of instance classes to choose from. 
all the way from like you see on the screen, uh, two vCPU and four GB RAM for a three three medium instance to ninety six uh, vCPU and seven sixty eight GB of RAM for the R five twenty four X large instances. Best practice is to ensure that the indexes and uh, working set fit in memory, and uh, the cache size of the memory that is available to you is two thirds of the RAM. The remaining one third is used by document DB processors and control plane and so on. So again, the best practice here is to ensure that you uh, maintain your working set and indexes in cache. And uh, when it comes to backup in document DB, you cannot turn backup off. The minimum backup retention period is one day and you can have a max maximum backup retention period of up to 35 days. The backup retention window can be useful to trigger other automated process. Let's say, for example, you want to use the snapshot when it is created to build dev and test cluster. So you can say during this window, whenever a cluster is created or when a snapshot is created, uh, you know, go and create a de uh, dev and test cluster. And it takes about five minutes to get the live data uh, to the backup. So you can recover from any time uh, from five minutes ago until the backup retention period that you chose while creating the cluster. So you can do point in time recovery from current time minus five minutes all the way up to your backup retention period. Moving on, let's look at the best practices when you're connecting to document DB from your applications. All instances uh, will have an instance endpoint, but we will rarely connect to document DB using this instance endpoint. What we will use instead to connect is the cluster endpoint. Cluster endpoint always points to the primary instance. So if a cluster is up, the cluster endpoint will point to an active node, which is the primary instance or the writer node. And if the primary fails, a replica instance is promoted to a new primary and the cluster endpoint is updated to point to this new primary. Thus, when you use cluster endpoint, you can be sure to connect to uh, the primary instance always for successfully writing data into document DB. And in the document DB console, you will also see something called reader endpoint. There is no real reason to use the reader endpoint. I'm, I'm talking about it because you, you might see this in the console. What reader endpoint does is, you know, it, it, it round robins between the replica instances. And uh, MongoDB drivers in a replica set mode which I'll talk about in, in a bit here, will handle this in a much more uh, elegant way. So the best practice is to always use the cluster endpoint when you're connecting to your document DB cluster. And when, when you're connecting to document DB, also connect as a replica set. Replica set is a <clears throat> Mongo multi-node concept. Using replica set allows you to connect to the cluster using any node and the application will automatically discover the other nodes along with the primary node. So it can then leverage all these other nodes to perform read operations. The note in this pic in this slide, uh, the cluster endpoint is in yellow color. And uh, for, for you know, when you're connecting uh, using replica set, that is that is highlighted in green. Right for now, the replica set is always named as RS0. We will discuss about the read preference uh, that is that is uh, written as uh, you know uh, secondary preferred in subsequent slides here. We will now discuss about the failover processes. Let's say we have a cluster with three instances, and the primary instance or the writer fails. Document DB will automatically failover. It will trigger a failover process to promote a replica instance to a new primary instance. And this process takes somewhere around you know, 30 seconds or, or less. And document DB will also spin up a new replica instance to replace the one that failed. So this will ensure that the cluster is written to its full strength to meet your SLAs. And instance type determines the connection and cursor limits. The largest instance in document DB, which is the R524X large, supports up to 30,000 concurrent connections. And this limit scales with the instance type you choose. And a couple of places where you know, we see uh, folks get into trouble is you know, when you're using driver 
uh, that that make poor choices about connection pooling. Uh, this and it can eventually create many connections more than what you really need. And also, when you're using containerized applications, they are so easy to deploy programmatically, and there can be many of them deployed, and you can quickly lose track of you know which which instance is creating or which which application instance in this case is creating how many connections. And taking these two together, you can at times hit the connection limits. So you know we'll want to monitor this limit, and we'll talk about this during the monitoring best practices uh, portion of this presentation. Cursors, uh, you know, they are like connection. They are also resources that should be uh, you know used, uh, knowing that they are not unlimited. So cursors supported in document DB uh, are up to you know 4,560 is the current limit. And they also scale with the instance type. So the largest instance supports uh, 4,560 uh, cursors. <clears throat> and one way, you know, you can uh, these limits get hit is when folks uh, do not explicitly close their cursors, right? Open cursors, uh, you know, are uh, are automatically reaped by document DB when they are open and idle for about 10 minutes. But that's not a good way to manage the cursors. So if you are hitting the cursor limit, and then probably it's a good idea to talk to your application team to see if they are following good cursor hygiene and if they're closing the cursors appropriately. An example would be if you're using like you know a programming language like Java or .NET, you know make sure that in a your your, your uh, query in a, in a when you're running a query in a finally block, for example, just go and say close cursor, right? So this will ensure that the cursor is always closed. Again, just like uh, connections, we would want to monitor this limit as well, and we'll, we'll cover that during monitoring uh, monitoring portion of this presentation. So let's now discuss about scaling document DB cluster. The reads uh, that are supported by the primary instance provide uh, read your own write consistency, or also known as immediate uh, consistency. Whereas the reads that are supported by the replica instances are eventually consistent. The latency between the primary and the replica read, replica instances are generally you know, around 10 to 100 milliseconds. Uh, on an average, I would say it's about 20 milliseconds. And to scale reads, you know, it is recommended that you use the replica instances. You can do so by using the read preference as secondary preferred. We kind of briefly touched upon it during the connection uh, best practices. So using the read preference as secondary preferred will allow you to use the available read replicas to query your document database, uh, document DB cluster for read operations. And if a replica instance goes down, when you use the read preference as secondary preferred, the read request will be directed to the next available replica instance. And what if that instance goes down and if no instances or replica instances are available, then the reads will be directed to the primary instance because you're saying the read preference is secondary preferred. So if secondaries are not available, uh, generally it will prefer secondary. If they are not available, it goes to primary. And let's say you want to scale your three instance cluster uh, to support high read throughput. How do you do that? Right? You can simply do that by adding more read replicas. You can add up to 15 read replicas. And again, when you're using read preference of 16 as, as uh, secondary preferred, the driver will use these new replicas automatically. Uh, especially when you're when you're when you say connecting using a replica set and read preference secondary preferred, these will be automatically discovered. You don't have to make any changes to your application, and the driver will start sending or routing the request to these new instances that you add, allowing you to automatically scale your reads. And sometimes you need both levels of consistency in your application, like an immediate consistent uh, read and an eventual consistent read. You can set the default and then override the, the read preference at, at a per query level. So in this example that you see, we set the default to secondary preferred because by default, we want to leverage the read, read replicas. And for stronger consistency, we set to primary for the queries that need them. And we do that explicitly on, on every query call. Right. In general, it is recommended to use homogeneous instances in a cluster, uh, or you know, using the same uh, sized instances in a cluster, like R five large in this example. However, you know, if your workload ha has a online, uh, sorry, on demand or periodic analytical needs, for example, you want to run an analytical report every month, right? It, it, this this report could take more compute 
and you know it's, it's more uh, analytical in nature with a lot of aggregations and so on and so forth uh, you, what you can do is you can you can still right size your cluster for that online workload and then add a node to perform this analytical operation and in this case as you see the node would be uh, you know so, would be larger than your regular instances, like instead of R5 large, it's R5 12 X large, for example, in this case, right? You can run the reporting queries against this analytical uh, node or instance, and then shut it down uh, when you don't need it, because you're gonna be running this report in this example, like every month. So just shut it down and then you can spin this back up again, because document DB, uh, DB's architecture basically, uh, you know, allows you to separate, uh, uh, you know, storage, scale storage and compute separately because they are uh, decoupled. So adding this additional R5 12, 12X large, eventually you would still take the same amount of time, which is eight to 10 minutes, regardless of your data volume. So you can run this uh, analytical uh, queries every month and right before you, whenever you want to run this, just spin that instance back up. So you'd, you can run asymmetrical workloads for, for these kind of requirements. And let's say our write throughput does increase, right? To scale our cluster that right now has, uh, you know, three R5 large instances uh, to R5 4X large instances, what we can do is add three R5 4X large instances, which is the destination that we want to reach to. And, uh, you know, just to be safe when you're adding this, you get an option to choose a promotion tier. You can uh, choose the promotion tier to be a higher value, like a tier zero for these large size nodes. Document DB will bias to choosing the larger uh, nodes to become the primary should the current primary fail. And you can, once you add those three nodes, you can trigger an auto failover and the larger instance will automatically be selected as the new primary. You can now delete those smaller R5 large instances and you'll be scaled uh, up in this case from R5 large to R5 4X large. So that's that's a good practice to follow if you wanna scale up your instances in the cluster. And storage and IO in document DB scales automatically. Storage is scaled in 10 gigabyte segments all the way up to 64 terabytes and the IO scales automatically as well. So you don't have to worry about provisioning SSDs or, or EBS volumes. One thing to note is document DB does not shrink storage. It uses a high watermark model. It will use the vacated space before allocating the new space DAO. So when you're migrating a large data set and if you plan on deleting the data after migrating to document DB, probably consider changing the approach and delete the data before migrating it into document DB so that you don't hit this, you don't pay the additional cost because of the high watermark uh, model. And talking about monitoring now, Document DB provides more than 50 metrics at both cluster and instance level. And in this section will look at some of the key metrics that I might want to consider uh, to monitor Document DB uh, performance and uh, you know reliability and so on. It's a best practice to create billing alarms. Uh, set two alarms, like one at 50% of your estimated spend and another at 75%. This will help you validate if your estimated bill is close to actual. And also uh, using cost allocation tags is a good practice. You can get cluster level visibility on your billing when you use cost allocation tags. For example, if you want to determine how much you're spending um, on a monthly basis or or whatever frequency you want to look look at it as right you can you can you know determine how much you're paying for dev clusters versus test versus prod and uh, you know you can can also then uh, determine at per dev cluster at, at you know within the dev clusters how much you're paying and so far so you can go fine grained and figure out which cluster is costing you how much and make appropriate decisions and then talking about the metrics itself at the instance level you know, you, you, the following metrics I would say should monitor at the minimum, uh, like the buffer cache at ratio. This tells you the percentage of requests that are served by the buffer cache uh, versus what is what is uh, served from the storage uh, distributed storage volume. And you know, this value we we and we recommend that you you know try to maintain an, uh, 95 percent or more and trigger an alarm if it goes below uh, you know 90 percent. Likewise, the next metric is the index buffer cache hit ratio. And this is the percentage of index requests that are served by the buffer cache. Again, just like uh, the buffer cache hit ratio, we would like this to be 
above 95% and trigger an alarm if it goes below 90%. Database connections, these indicates the number of connections open on an instance taken at a one minute frequency. And, uh, you know, database cursors are the number of cursors, just like the connections open on an instance taken at a one minute frequency. And both of these connections and cursors, their limits, like we discussed earlier, they vary by the instance uh, size. And, you know, it's a good practice to set an alarm when you're hitting like 80% of the of their limit, right? So if you're using R524X large, 30,000 is the connection limit and uh, 4,560 is the cursor limit. So set an alarm at 80% of these numbers and uh, you know see what is causing those increase in connections if at all you hit the alarm. And then freeable memory and CPU utilizations are just like any other EC2 instances. We don't like to see those getting near their limits and staying there for longer time. So if you see CPU to be at, uh, you know, uh, let's say 80% and it's pegged at that uh, number, then try it considering scaling up. And then at the, at the cluster level, you have DB cluster replica lag maximum. This is a replica lag between the primary and the replica instances. And the ideal value for this is should be somewhere around 10 to 100 milliseconds. And uh, you know the database cursors timeout, this tells you how many cursors have been idle and hence document DB read them off after 10 minutes. And if this number goes up, that means your applications are not closing their cursors. So you need to talk to them to see they can maintain a good uh, cursor hygiene to your developers, I mean. And then volume write IOPS and read IOPS, um, you know, this measures what you're built for. Uh, there's not much to alarm on, but it's good for investigating any issues or behavior. And likewise, op counters, it tells you all the CRUD operations uh, you know, that are coming to this cluster. Again, uh, not, nothing to alarm on, but uh, good for investigating issues and behavior and understanding what your read and write rates are to this cluster. Then auditing and profiling are, are supported by DocumentDB and uh, to you know, log the values in the audit and profiler log, you should enable them explicitly using the cluster parameter group. You can monitor DDL events, authentication events, role-based access control events. For example, you can see who's creating a collection, who's creating an index and all that stuff. And you can create alarms and trigger notifications when any anomalies are detected. For example, let's say, if you're getting a, a invalid authentication event 10 times in a row within within like let's say 10 seconds, you can trigger notification and see if anybody is trying to get into your system, right? And the profiler log, right? You can enable the profiler log and uh, use it to troubleshoot slow queries. It'll give you the query plan and uh, what index is used and where the time is spent. So it's a very useful tool for tuning your queries and, and observing performance. Indexing with Document DB, right? So let's talk about some of the indexing best practices here. First and foremost, ensure that all your queries are using appropriate index. Create index on fields that are highly cardinal because high cardinal uh, fields, when you create index on them, it ensures that you have high selectivity. Ideally, we would want the selectivity to be 1% of your total data set. And it's always a good practice to limit the number of indexes to be less than or equal to five. Uh, and you know, if you see this number increasing, then look at opportunities to see if you can combine your singleton indexes into compound indexes, right? So those, those, if you exceed that five, then probably it's a good exercise to review and analyze what indexes you have and see if you can create more compound indexes as opposed to simple indexes. And as discussed earlier, what, during sizing, ensure that your indexes fit in memory. You can use index stats to determine the index size, uh, like you see on the screen here, and determine uh, the instance size that will uh, you know, fit this index in memory. And uh, again, how, how you know whether it is uh, whether the instance is sitting in memory or not, you can monitor the index buffer cache at ratio to check if the indexes are scanned from memory or disk. And then uh, you should use index stats periodically to determine the unused indexes and remove them from your uh, from your collection, because unused indexes are gonna you know occupy memory and storage. It's 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 gonna result in uh, you know unnecessary cost and performance issues. So let's now discuss about how to optimize cost with Document DB. Right. So Document DB has four different pricing dimensions. Uh, the first dimension is uh, the instance itself, right? And this, this, the cost for this is going to vary by the instance size. For example, if you're using T3 medium, uh, document DB will charge you eight cents an hour. 
And the pricing precision is at a per second level with a 10 minute minimum. The second dimension is storage and document DB charges you 10 cents per gigabyte. Again, this is considering US East, but the cost is gonna be comparable across the regions. And the third dimension is IO and document DB charges you 20 cents per million IOPS. And any operation that, that takes place between the compute instance and the storage will, will result in an IO. And if it is a read operation, a docs up to eight kilobytes results in one IO. And for write operation, docs up to four kilobytes results in one IO. So again, it's important to keep your document size uh, at an optimal level. So we typically recommend to keep the document size below eight KB so that your IO cost is not increased because of the document size. The fourth pricing dimension is backup. And the cost for the initial data load is, is free, followed by two cents per gigabyte. For, for, for incremental storage uh, or incremental increase in the storage uh, in your cluster. Again, the reason the initial data load is free is because you cannot disable backup. So you know by default, one day backup is en uh, enabled for you so that you can do point in time recovery at least for one day. And we don't charge you for backing up that initial uh, load of the data. And you know, one, one way to reduce cost uh, when you're using document DB is to make sure that your cluster is not over provisioned. So you need to ask yourself this question and do this periodic review. Do you need all the replicas that you are using today? You know, consider your availability target. In your lower environment, do you need four nines of availability? If two nines is sufficient, maybe one instance is good enough because keep in mind with one instance, you still get a very high durability. And uh, you know, do you need a larger instance in a lower environment? Can, can a lower instance type like T3 medium work for you? Because that is gonna again, help reduce your cost. Uh, so basically look at reducing the instance size and reducing the number of instances, especially in the lower environment to save on cost. And then you can also stop and start document DB cluster. This is a very good option uh, for dev and test clusters. Uh, so let's say your developers take off for the weekend on a Friday evening. You can you you can stop the instances uh, or stop the cluster and then come back on Monday and start it. Right. So when you stop a, a, a cluster, you will not incur any instance charges. Since your data is still in the cluster, you will continue to incur storage cost, and the backup cost is not going to increase because there's not going to be an incremental storage since there's no instance to accept writes. So you will you will save a lot by not paying for the instance when you stop a cluster. And you know, uh, the IO, which is the third pricing dimension that we talked about, to optimize the IO cost, ensure that the instance size that you chose fits the indexes and working set in memory. Because when, when, it, when, the, when working set and indexes are in memory, it increases the cache hit ratio and reduces the IOs, which in turn reduces your IO cost. And also, if your use case uh, you know, has TTL indexes to delete the data, be aware that those, those deletes are also gonna result in IO. If possible, use a rolling collection. For example, one collection a day and then keep dropping uh, you know, every eighth collection if you want to retain data for, let's say, a week, right? You can, again, it's just a simple idea of you know, uh, grouping the data by collections and dropping the collection. Because when you drop a collection, there is not gonna be an IO cost. Again, this may not be applicable to every use case, but think about it. And if you can, then that will help you save some IO cost. And define purge requirements and remove the documents that are beyond the retention period. Also remove unused indexes. And document DB is a online, it's use it more like an OLTP system, right? Online transaction processing system. Uh, it is not a replacement for a data lake or a data warehouse. So you know, define purge requirements and, and delete the data that is that's beyond the retention period. And also if you're using manual snapshots, you know, make sure that you delete them, the, uh, uh, you know, uh, when, when they become obsolete or when you no, don't need them, right? So you can select a backup retention period. And, uh, you know, uh, within that retention period, if you're creating a manual snapshot, document DB doesn't charges you. But keep in mind that that retention period is a rolling window. So as the retention period moves on, and if you do, if you if you happen to have a, a, a manual snapshot that is no longer in the retention period, you're going to be charged for that. So make sure that you you delete those manual snapshots that are no longer required because they're going to be like you know full backups. Yes, they are charged at S3 prices, but uh, which is about two cents a gigabyte. But still, deleting the unused uh, manual snapshots will help you save cost. 
And the last topic on best practices is security. Right, so document DB uh, as of today is accessible within a VPC. Uh, and it's a best practice to limit the surface area of attack to document DB by defining a security group such that only the application servers uh, uh, that you know reside in a specific security group communicate with document DB and that too over a specific port, which is 27017 over TCP. So this will ensure that you know you uh, limit access to document DB to known set of application servers belonging to a security group. And then document DB supports uh, username password authentication. Right? So when you create a cluster, you, you, you create a master username and master password. Do not use this master username and password for anything uh, else other than creating cluster or admin users, right? And today, uh, if you let's say if you want the role-based access control in document DB is at a cluster and a database level. And if you want to gra access grant access to the collection, you can put the collection in its own database and grant access to that, right? So if you want to have fine-grained access at the collection level. But what, what is out of the box available is fine-grained access, or you can create users at a uh, cluster and the database level. And as mentioned before, you can monitor audit logs for authentication events and permission grant options. Right? Cluster deletion protection is enabled by default so that you know, uh, we can help you to prevent accidental deletion of clusters. Of course, you can go ahead and disable it, but uh, the default option is to enable it. And document DB supports TLS for encrypting data over the wire and AWS uh, key management service for encrypting data at rest. With KMS, you can use uh, you know, AWS managed key or you can bring your own key as well. And you get all the benefits of key rotation and the key policies that, that AW, uh, AWS KMS provides uh, since, since it natively integrates with DocumentDB. And talking about native integration to DocumentDB, the other service from a security standpoint that we integrate with is Secrets Manager. Uh, and when you use Secrets Manager to store DocumentDB credentials, uh, from an application perspective, the application will provide a secret name uh, when calling the Secret Manager API, and Secrets Manager will return the credentials to access Document DB. You can also leverage uh, the out-of-the-box capability that Secrets Manager provides to rotate credentials. And it is a recommended practice to leverage Secrets Manager integration to manage your database credentials so that you don't accidentally check in your code uh, by maintaining it in the application layer and then checking it into GitHub or something like that. So. So again, integration with Secrets Manager is, is built in natively for you to you know, efficiently manage your credentials. So that brings us to the end of this session. You can learn more about DocumentDB by visiting the link on the slide. Thank you all. In this section, we will discuss about migrations to Amazon DocumentDB. We will start with why customers are migrating to document DB and then discuss about the tools that are available to perform these migrations. Uh, we will talk about different phases that are involved in migration and then you know, also discuss the various methods uh, that customers use to migrate to document DB. We will then discuss the best practices to follow when you're migrating to document DB and we'll wrap up with a quick demo. All right, let's start with uh, motivation. Uh, you know, why, why uh, our customers are migrating to DocumentDB? Now, some of the reasons uh, are listed on the slide, right? So DocumentDB is a purpose-built database service architected to support your operational workload, especially when your data is modeled as JSON. JSON by itself provides schema flexibility and DocumentDB allows you to query data across any field in this JSON document letting you to leverage the flexibility offered by JSON. Also, DocumentDB is architected for cloud, and it auto-scales storage and IOs uh, so that you don't have to worry about uh, provisioning EBS volumes or expensive SSD disks. DocumentDB is a fully managed service and has a consumption-based uh, billing to help you reduce the overall total cost of ownership, or TCO. These are some of the reasons that we see why customers are migrating to DocumentDB. And, and we see customers migrating from various sources, you know, like most of our customers migrate from MongoDB, 
But we also see customers migrating from relational databases and uh, key value stores as well. These are like most of the time, these are you know application modernization efforts. And we also see migrations uh, coming from Elasticsearch where customers have more than just text search needs, right? Where they wanna do more secondary lookups uh, based on different, different fields in JSON. For this conversation today, we will focus on MongoDB migration though. Let's take a look at some of the tools that are available for migration. And AWS uh, database migration service supports MongoDB and many other uh, relational database as source and document DB as its destination. You can use DMS to perform a full load of your data and also replicate ongoing changes in near real time. Document DB is compatible with MongoDB and hence to migrate data from MongoDB in particular. Uh, in addition to DMS, you can also use uh, MongoDum to dump the data from MongoDB and MongoRestore to re restore the data into DocumentDB. Also, DocumentDB integrates with AWS Glue, and uh, we have customers that use Glue to extract the data and transform the data from their source database. Generally, these are relational databases, and then they load this data uh, using the Glue integration to DocumentDB. Uh, they, they load this data into DocumentDB. And it's, it's uh, you know good to understand different phases involved in migration. We'll talk about the various methods and how to do the migration, but let's let's you know level set our understanding on you know what are the different phases you should be considering when you're migrating to DocumentDB. So we recommend customers go through these four migration phases. Right? Discovery phase is all about finding figuring figuring out your compatibilities, right? Like while DocumentDB is compatible with MongoDB, there are some functional differences as well. And then the next phase is planning phase, where you know you would focus on how to do this migration, which migration method, which we'll be talking about in a bit here, suits you the best based on your situation, right? And the next phase is testing. As, as simple as it may seem, this is the most critical and uh, important phase in migration, right? You should test your workload for not just functionality, but also performance in a lower environment and then migrate into a production environment. And then the last phase is execution, where you bring all of this together and perform the migration based on the option you choose uh, for migration, migrating during planning, based on the test case uh, you know you created during testing phase, and so on. And our docs, uh, you know, cover these in uh, greater depth. So please refer them, uh, you know, at your convenience. So we'll double click on each of these phases a little bit more. Uh, let's start with the discovery phase. During this phase, the primary thing you would be doing is, you know, uh, verifying verify compatibility, right? Make sure that your application is compatible. Compare, uh, you know, the database version of MongoDB. DocumentDB supports and is compatible with MongoDB 3.6 and 4.0. Just make sure which version of MongoDB you are using today. The official upgrade path is, you know, if you are on a lower version of MongoDB, you should go to, two, if you're, let's say you're on a 2.6, then go to 3.0 uh, or 3.6 with MongoDB and then migrate into DocumentDB. We've seen customers migrating from lower versions of MongoDB directly into DocumentDB uh, and, 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 you know, it, it has worked without issues, but we would rec strongly recommend that you test it thoroughly in a lower environment before migrating uh, into DocumentDB from a lower version of MongoDB. And when it comes to driver version, generally the latest versions of the drivers are compatible. Uh, for example, you can use the driver version 4.2 with document DB 4.0. Even though the server version is 4.0, you can the latest versions are compatible, and and uh, it would it would work just fine. Uh, like I said before, we are not 100% compatible with MongoDB. We have some functional differences and some APIs that are not supported. So. You know, you should refer our documentation for details because we document uh, each and every uh, op at the operator and API level. We document what is supported and what is not. And I will discuss during the best practices uh, portion of this presentation on how you can verify compatibility uh, using some of the tools that we have built for you. Also, you know, consider the deployment type for MongoDB before migration, right? So when you're migrating your MongoDB workload to DocumentDB, you will be using one of these deployment types like standalone or replica set or even a sharded cluster. Uh, to have minimum downtime with migration, it is important that you use op log. Uh, and if you're using standalone, 
uh, deployment, then you must convert that deployment into replica set so that there is an op log. And the easiest way to do that is just say rs.initiate command on a Mongo shell, right? And if downtime is acceptable for you, uh, then, then you don't have to do this, right? You can just convert your standalone replica set using Mongo dump and restore that data into document DB. And if you are using a replica set deployment, it is most straightforward and most common uh, across our customers that we've seen. And you can you know, migrate uh, those replica set deployments using DMS, or you can also use dump and restore. And I'll talk about uh, how you would use those tools uh, just in a bit here. And let's say you have sharded clusters and you want to migrate from a sharded deployment into DocumentDB, and we have a lot of customers doing that as well. You will have to migrate those shards in parallel as DocumentDB does not support sharding. And you know, it is important that you size your instances appropriately, right? Understand what are your read and write rates uh, at both peak and sustained loads, as this would determine the IOPS required for your cluster. And uh, you know, DocumentDB just builds you for IOPS, so it's important to understand those ca uh, data characteristics. Also, talking about data characteristics, you know, they, they do play an important role in your cost because let's say your average document size, you know, what is what is the current uh, data footprint? And how does it grow, right? An example is you take the document size, and uh, you know it, it it has an impact on both the IOPS cost and storage, right? Because uh, if, you, if you have a larger document to read and write, it's going to require more IOPS, and also the larger document is result in you know cumulatively, if you take all the documents together, it's going to result in more storage. Also, backup contributes to billing, and uh, understand what your recovery point objectives are, and uh, use appropriate backup retention period. Right? Define those data retention requirements because you know under, it's important to understand that how that will how the data retention period requ requirements will drive the cost. Uh, and you know it's it'll it's always good to have that uh, idea before you perform this migration. And I'll discuss best practice to uh, on, on on how you can size your cluster later in this presentation as well. Also be informed about the migration options, right? We'll discuss the migration methods in a bit. Depending on your deployment type, determine how to best migrate to DocumentDB using one of those migration methods. Op log, like I said before, helps with minimum downtime migration. And uh, you know migrations that can take a long time uh, for the initial load, uh, you need to be sure that the op log is uh, sized appropriately because if the op log is too small, you may cap the size on the op log and the new changes that are coming in may not be replicated and you may be running into issues with migration. So it is very important to size your op log large enough so that uh, after the full load, the ongoing replications are, are migrated without losing any data, right? So, so those are the things that you, you look at during the planning, uh, uh, sorry, during the discovery phase. Let's move on to the planning phase. In this phase, you choose your migration approach uh, whether you want to do an offline migration or an online migration or a combination of the two, which is a hybrid migration. You'll also create your associated test plan as you wrap up your planning phase. And then during the testing phase, ensure that indexes are pre-created. Index creation in DocumentDB is sequential. So pre-creating index on an empty collection will be orders of magnitude faster. And then as your data is restored or replicated from DMS, those index updates will happen in parallel uh, to, to keep up with the incoming data. An op log, uh, you know, like I said before, size this to be big enough, uh, you know, before running out of op log ring buffer. Um, so how, how big enough should you size it, right? So if it takes, let's say, five hours to dump or uh, do a full load of your initial data, then I would say size your op log to be, you know, twice that size. Size your op log to size where it can take 10 hours of data. And to have minimum downtime migration, op log is very important and you must size it appropriately. And if you are uh, you know, migrating from a sharded MongoDB deployments, ensure that you move the individual replica sets in parallel. Also very important, turn off the balancer to avoid shard rebalancing during migration. Right? Because uh, while migrating sharded cluster, the data must not be rebalanced. And this is required so that you can avoid having orphan documents. And if the balancer you know, is on, then it can fail to move chunks of data. And this would leave documents on target shards 
uh, as orphaned, right? And this can result in duplicate data during migration. You can certainly run a command to do cleanup if you have orphaned uh, documents. But again, the best practice is to just turn off the balancer uh, to avoid shard rebalancing. And if you do the first three phases right, if you take your time and make sure that you go follow these steps, then the execution phase will become simpler where all that you do is follow the test plan, track the migration progress, and communicate uh, the planned migration to you know, your stakeholders, and then just uh, simply go forward with the migration. So let's now discuss about the various methods available to migrate data uh, to document DB. The common migration methods, as I briefly touched upon earlier, are offline, online, and hybrid. For the online and hybrid method, you will be using the AWS uh, database migration service, also known as DMS. And uh, you can use DMS free for six months uh, to migrate data into DocumentDB. So the first method is the offline method. Right? It's, it's, uh, you know, you, in this method, what you do is you can use Mongo dump and restore, and you can migrate very quickly. This method is super simple. It's fast, but it does have downtime, right? So if you can withstand downtime, then this is the best option considering its simplicity. In this method, what you do is your application, uh, like you see in this diagram, stops writing to MongoDB as a first step. You then perform a Mongo dump on the, on the source MongoDB cluster. And the next step is to pre-create your indexes in DocumentDB. This is a best practice and is recommended for all the migration methods that I'll be discussing today which is going to be in the next couple of slides. After you pre-create uh, the indexes, you can restore the data into DocumentDB using Mongo Restore, and then just switch your application to point to DocumentDB. Now, one thing to keep in mind is during the steps two, three, and four, as indicated in this diagram, the application is going to be unavailable. So that's, that's the downtime I was referring to before. Um, so Mongo, uh, you know, dump and restore, like I said before, it's, it's a very simple approach. And if downtime is applicable to your workload, you can use this method. If downtime is not an option, then you can use the online method uh, where we'll be using DMS. It is not overly complicated and it also helps minimize uh, downtime uh, to, for migration, right? So in this method, the application will continue to use MongoDB and like before, you would pre-create the indexes, create a DMS task using the database migration service, and you'll choose an option in the DMS task as full load and replicate data with CDC mode. Right? With this option, what, what DMS does is it performs a full load of the data that is in your MongoDB and uh, loads it into DocumentDB, and then performs ongoing replication so that any changes that come in uh, to MongoDB is automatically replicated to DocumentDB. And for this uh, ong replication, DMS tails op log on the MongoDB source, and any changes that come into the source is replicated to the target. And after your uh, you know replication is caught up, all that you do is switch your endpoint in your application to point to document DB. Right? MongoDB source and document DB in this setup can be run in parallel as long as you need and you're comfortable to make the cutover. And talking about downtime, the only downtime is when your application you know, cuts over from MongoDB to DocumentDB when you make that switch of endpoint, that's the only downtime we are talking about. And the hybrid method, which is the third and the final method, uh, it combines both offline and online approach together. So it brings the goodness of uh, offline and online method together. This is faster than the online method, but requires a little bit more setup. So it has very similar to online method. This has near zero uh, downtime. Uh, and the additional setup here is because you have to do both Mongo dump and restore and use DMS. So let's, let's talk about uh, you know, how that uh, works by walking through this diagram. So again, the application continues to use MongoDB uh, and you will use Mongo dump to dump the data from MongoDB, like the first approach, the offline approach. And then you pre-create indexes. This is common across all the approach. And then you restore data into document DB using Mongo restore, right? Since, since full load is done using uh, Mongo dump and restore, when you're using database migration service, uh, you would enable replication with CDC mode only. Whereas in the online approach, we said full load and CDC. Here we are gonna just say enable replication with CDC only. 
And like before, after the replication is caught up, just switch the endpoint to point to document DB. And again, the downtime is going to be the cutover time from uh, you know MongoDB endpoint switching to document DB. And now let's talk about the best practices for migration. I'd like to start with uh, some of the homegrown tools that the specialist solutions architect like myself and my colleagues have built to help our customers. Uh, these tools are not officially supported by AWS, but these these are helpful for you to do things like you know compatibility. So let's say you want to you know uh, verify compatibility. You we have put together a tool that will parse your Mongo logs and uh, let you know if there are any operators that are not compatible, right? And if you want to do sizing and estimate pricing, we have a calculator that accepts the you know, data characteristics as input and provides the sizing and pricing information for your workload as an output. This is a good information uh, and a good place to get started uh, to start perf uh, performance benchmarking your cluster and uh, you know, determine your scale needs if you want to scale up or, or down from there, but you get a good starting point. And to help with index compatibility assessment, we have a tool that parses your index in MongoDB and provides you know, information on incompatible indexes if there are any in your cluster, in your MongoDB cluster. This tool also provides you an option to pre-create indexes in DocumentDB. And uh, in addition to compatibility and sizing, like I said before, it is very important that you size your op log to capture all change events uh, during the migration. So your op log should be big enough so that after the full load, uh, 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 any changes that had come during the full load and after, your, your op log is, is sized to capture those, right? And to speed up migration, you can you know, scale your primary instance uh, in document DB and then scale it back down. This will give you more compute uh, to process additional writes. So you can increase your write throughput and take more writes per second. And then after the migration is done, you can scale back, back down, right? And uh, if you're using Mongo dump and restore, you can set the num insertion workers per collection to match the number of vCPUs on your primary instance. This will speed up the migration because what this does is it lets you leverage the parallel execution of threads while restoring the data. So you can restore data in parallel across the available compute on the primary instance. And uh, it is very important that you remove the unused indexes and uh, the data that is beyond the retention period prior to migrating data into document db document db follows a high watermark model uh, so let's say you have a 10 terabytes of data and uh, you know you cleaned up 2 terabytes of data after migrating to document db the high watermark model based pricing will charge you 10 terabytes and not 8 terabytes while no additional cost will be added until the 2 terabytes data comes in uh, you can certainly save costs by you know, deleting the data before migrating into DocumentDB. Lastly, testing is not optional. It's very important that you, uh, you know, uh, perform testing in a lower environment before migrating your workload uh, and uh, be up and running in a production environment. So with that, let's uh, take a look at a demo. So we'll, we'll look at the second approach that we discussed today, which is online migration uh, from MongoDB to Amazon DocumentDB. I'll just quickly walk you through the, the DMS configuration and uh, show you how this migration works. All right, so I'm here at the um, at my AWS account and I'm at the database migration service. Um, so if you look at uh, this, I'm at the endpoints uh, tab. And we have two endpoints here. I've, I've, I've predefined the endpoint. So what I have here in my setup is I have a MongoDB uh, instance uh, uh, running running on EC2, um, which is which is a very common uh, setup for our customers, where you know you want to migrate MongoDB running on EC2 to a fully managed database service like DocumentDB. So this EC2 instance is running MongoDB. It's a very simple setup, and uh, in DMS. I first define a MongoDB source endpoint. Let's look at what this endpoint looks like, right? So I have configured this as a source endpoint, gave it an identifier, and uh, you chose the engine as MongoDB, right? So you can see that you can choose other engines as well if you're coming from a relational database or whatever. But in this case, we are doing a migration from MongoDB. So the source uh, is to, uh, engine is selected as MongoDB. And I gave the name of the server, the port, 
and uh, you know, um, I did not enable SSL on this for just because it's a demo. Um, and then, you know, I have uh, given a username to access the database and a password. And uh, you know, the authentication source is the admin database in MongoDB, and the database that we are trying to migrate is LabDB. And uh, that's that's pretty much it for the MongoDB source endpoint. The other endpoint that I have created is document DB uh, target endpoint. And like before, let's go ahead and modify this and take a look at what this endpoint configuration looks like. So it is configured as a target endpoint. The target engine is chosen as Amazon document DB. So we are migrating from MongoDB to document DB. So we've chosen the target engine here as Amazon document DB and back there as in the source as Mo uh, MongoDB. And I'm giving my uh, server name, which I'll show you in a bit here, which uh, I've already pre-created this cluster. And then I'm, this, this one uh, I have created with SSL uh, so that you can see what the SSL configuration looks like. I'm saying verify full and I've given the certificate as well. And then I give the credentials, my username and the database that I'm trying to migrate to. And that's pretty much it. So those are the endpoint configuration. The other component we need is a replication instance, which basically is the one that is going to do the task of reading data from MongoDB and writing it into document DB. So let's look at what this uh, looks like. It's a very simple uh, you know, setup. You just give the name and uh, choose an instance type. So you can choose like, you know, uh, like in this case, it's uh, I've chosen T2 medium, but you have a lot of options here to choose from depending on what workload you're migrating. I do, uh, you can also choose to have multi AZ deployment if you want high availability, but since this is a demo environment, I chose not to. And uh, that's that's pretty much it. The, uh, the other one uh, before we move off of this is a security group, right? So I have given a security group called, uh, you know, Migration Lab MongoDB Access. This is important because um, if, you, if you recall, uh, you know, when I was talking about the best practices, um, you know, it, uh, it is important to limit surface area of attack to your document DB cluster. So uh, in, in the document DB cluster creation process, I gave a security group, which will allow access from this uh, security group. So in other words, this replication instance is now going to be able to talk to document DB because of the security group configuration that I've created for document DB, which I'll walk, walk you through as well. So, you know, uh, actually let's go and take a look at that security group and come back to this. So, uh, the, which I'm going to go to the security group section over here and, uh, you can see that the MongoDB migration access is creates the security group created and i also have a dog db security group and if i look at the inbound rules for the dog db security group it has this migration lab mongodb access as one of the inbound rule and it also has a cloud9 environment as as another um you know security on another rule here so in, in a nutshell um you know the document db cluster that i have will allow access from this cloud9 environment as well as from any instances that have the MongoDB uh, access, my, Migration Lab MongoDB access as its security group, right? So those are the inbound rules for my document DB cluster. And here is my document DB cluster. And you can see that uh, the dog DB inbound rule that we just uh, walked through is, is uh, associated to this particular cluster. So, so that's about the security group configuration. So let me go back to the uh, the DMS service. And uh, so we, so far we've created two endpoints in a replication instance. So now what we're gonna do is through the migration task, tie them all together, right? So you can see that I have a ta DMS task created over here. And uh, you, know, you can see that in this DMS task, I'm saying do nothing for the target table preparation mode because I'm just gonna replicate whatever is there in MongoDB. And after the full load completes, I'm saying don't stop because I'm gonna be migrating data, uh, not just for full load, but also replicate ongoing changes. And then at the end, I'm also leaving this uh, limited LOB mode to the default of 32 kilobytes. Um, so that if there's anything more than 32 kilobyte, uh, you know, it will it will not include those in the replication. And, uh, you know, you can you can also, you know, here you see that in a, uh, I'm, I'm, I've written a, a selection rule saying that, hey, LabDB is my uh, collection. Um, sorry, the database. Uh, it has like uh, two collections in it. Um, so I'm just saying take all of them 
and include them while you're doing the migration. So migrate this database with all its collection into document DB is what I'm saying. So and if you look at this migration task, uh, you know the, the type is full load with ongoing replication, which is again the online approach. And uh, the MongoDB source endpoint is, uh, is associated to the source and target over here. And the replication instance that we walk through is over here. So all, all of the three components we created, the task ties them together and defines the type of uh, migration, right? So in this case, full load and ongoing replication. So before I go ahead and, and start this task, which will start replicating data from MongoDB to DocumentDB, I want to show you that uh, you know, I'm, I'm at the Mongo shell here pointing to DocumentDB, and I want to show you uh, what databases this particular cluster has. So I'm at the uh, you know getting started cluster that we just saw, and I have three databases, case, catalog, and YCSP. And the database I'm trying to migrate from the MongoDB instance uh, running on EC2 is called LabDB, which is what my, my task over here is configured to do. So I'm going to go to this task and I'm going to say, you know, uh, start or restart or resume. Since I already have this task, it gives me an option to restart or resume. So I'm going to restart this task and say start, right? And you can see, uh, you know, that this task is, uh, it'll, be, it'll be starting in a, in a moment here. Uh, so you can see the status after I refresh change to starting. So this task is starting. And in a, in a moment, it will change to, to running, right? So what it does is it initially performs the full load. And when it completes full load, it will say full load complete and performing ongoing replication. So those are the various status. So from start, it should change to running. There you go. The status is now changed to running. So again, if you look at this, it is, it is loading data into document DB. And uh, we can also go to document DB and see if the new uh, database called labs DB is created. And you can see that the database is created. Yes, it is still performing the full load migration, but we can go and look into it to see um, you know, what, what data it contains. So I'm saying use lab DB and let's look at what collections this has. This has customers and locations as two of its collections. So I'm gonna say db.customers.find1. I'm just running a MongoDB command to see if it is really bringing in the data. So yes, it is bringing in the data as well, right? So, so you can see that uh, the migration has started and uh, you know it is, it is performing full load. And you can see that this, the rows are now uh, incrementing. You can, if, if you keep, uh, you know, look, uh, monitoring this particular table, you can see, you know, it, it has, it's been about a minute, 30 to seconds since the load uh, lapsed, and it, it will continue to load the data. So after it completes the full load, which will take about four to five minutes, the status will change to uh, replicating ongoing data, right? Full load complete ongoing replication is what the new, the final status would be. So. So yeah, again, when I refresh, I see that the new data, new rows are now in, uh, shown over here. So, so that's that's about what I wanted to cover in the migration uh, demo. So again, uh, the real quick summary of what we saw. We looked at the endpoints, uh, MongoDB source and target endpoints, and we looked at the replication instance that is used to uh, you know uh, read from Mongo and write into DocumentDB and how the tasks ties them all together and how you, when you start the task, it starts doing the full load migration. And after it completes, uh, you would be you know, eventually seeing that it will do a, a ongoing replication. So that, let's go back to the presentation. Uh, the last slide I just really have is I wanted to really thank you for your time and attention. And uh, you know, I, I appreciate you guys spending time to learn more about uh, Document DB and how you can migrate into the service. Uh, please uh, let us know if you have any questions or any feedback. Um, or we are always active on our forums. Um, so you know, with that, I'll, I'll thank you again and take care of yourselves. Bye bye.